Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to today's session. And today we are actually doing the final session of ancient India. Okay. Today is the last session from this textbook. Uh, so I will be covering three chapters today. Uh, I mean, uh, these are, you know, fairly easy chapters because most of the points we saw uh, up till now are again repeated. Okay, since this this is the last lecture, there is a, uh, there is a kind of a summarization of everything that we have already studied. So most of it will be like a revision for you, but some new points also for Plim's point perspective and all. All right, so the last three chapters of Standard Eleven Ancient India textbook written by R. S. Sharma sir. Okay, so welcome to Madhav Shankar classes. I am Madhav Shankar Arvaria. Please subscribe to this channel and like this video. Also share it with your friends as well so that they can also benefit from uh, all these lectures. All right, so from tomorrow onwards, we will start the final series that is on art and culture. That won't be this lengthy series, okay? I mean, these series are like 10, 11, and Medieval India lecture was 16 parts. But uh, art and culture will be comparatively smaller, maybe maximum six lectures, that's all. Anyway, we will finish by June, uh, sorry, July uh, 13th or 14th, something like that. All right. So again, welcome. Uh, I welcome all of you to this final session from Ancient India, and we are starting with the chapter Transformation of the Ancient Face. So as usual, let me just you know, remind you: the entire PDF of all my lectures are available in my Telegram channel. It is given here. The link is given here. You can also download the same, or you know, uh, go to the Telegram channel using the link given in the description section in YouTube. Okay, and if you face any kinds of doubts or any you need more clarifications on anything that I talk during my class, you can always contact me via Telegram or WhatsApp. Uh, the contact methods are given in tele this uh, Telegram channel. Okay, or through Facebook or Instagram. I'm available in all these platforms. Okay, so transformation of the ancient face. This is the first chapter that we are going to see today. So we will start with social crisis and the origin of land grants. Okay, we talked a lot about Varna system and we talked a lot about the or you know land grants that came into the fourth, especially during Harshavardhana period. Although the practice was even, you know there even before that. But anyway, what is what is this social crisis and what is actually the cause or the origin of land grants? That is the central issue that we are going to discuss today. Okay. So the most important factor, the central factor that actually led to the transformation of ancient Indian society into the medieval Indian society is actually the practice of land grants. Okay, there are plenty of things that contributed to this transformation, but the most central thing that changed ancient India into medieval India is actually the practice of land grants. All right, so in ancient Indian period, we have already learned this. Kings wanted to, you know, acquire this religious validation to rule the place and all. They wanted that Kshatriya title branded upon them from the Brahmanas. Okay, and in return, kings, you know, kings and kshatriyas gave a lot of uh, gifts and presents and you know donations, etc., to the priestly classes. So this kind of arrangement went on for a very long time in ancient India, right? But the two lower sections, Vaishyas and Shudras, were more or less always oppressed and you know rejected, especially the Shudra classes. The only producing class, okay, the only food producing class or say in any respect, uh, the productive class in the economy was Vaishyas, also with some help from Shudras. Okay, so the, uh, the producing activities of the peasants were generally done by the Vaishyas and the laborers, okay, the menial laborers were actually the Shudras. So these two classes, despite having to do all the major work, were always oppressed one way or another by the Brahmanical and Kshatriya classes. And we have already learned about this very famous uh, event in the 3rd and 4th century AD, the Kali Yuga. Okay, the, the so-called term mentioned in Puranas regarding the, you know, very famous Kali Yuga, which basically means the Varnas, especially the Vaishyas and Shudras, not performing their jobs. Alright, according to Dharma, according to Dharma Shastras, each Varnas has to have their own, uh, you know, respective uh, roles to play in the society. They are supposed to do their part. But if anything, you know, any kind of resistance act, uh, actually happens against it, then such a situation is known as Kali Yuga. 
and it is the duty of the king to make sure that everything is back in order and the varna classification is preserved in the society okay so the king is supposed to bring back dharma in the society and this dharma basically means the varna classification okay so in the 3rd and 4th century ad we have these instances where you know lower classes refuse to pay their tax and provide free labor etc and we also see some kind of a varna sankara during this period so what is varna sankara we haven't seen this term as such yet but we have already learned what this is basically due to various processes such as say you know arrival of foreigners such intermingling between various classes also by the induction of tribals into the brahmanical order all these caused mixing of different varnas and you know arise of more and more sub castes and you know uh, you know within varnas itself many many subdivisions started coming coming up so this intermixing is known as varna sangara okay so in the 3rd and 4th century ad we find varna sangara taking place in the indian society and the varna barriers were attacked okay i mean the fourfold varna classification is now very much uh, you know uh, it's not exactly clear this society is not strictly classified as brahmanas vaishyas sh uh, sh uh, sorry kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras although that classification still exist within them there are again sub classifications say you know wealthy brahmanas take up the you know priestly classes and all then there are poor brahmanas also there okay among shudras also there are wealthier people and you know very poor people vaishyas also very wealthy uh, very you know landed personalities and then there are poorer sections so then as uh, certain tribal people has been inducted into the brahmanical order they formed a different class kshatriya class again had divisions because the foreigners who came to india were inducted as kshatriyas especially second grade kshatriyas we talked about all these things earlier itself okay so because of all these things varna barriers started were you know getting attacked in the society during this period so obviously the top two classes especially the you know brahmanas and uh, kshatriyas they had to do something to preserve the varna system they have to do something to preserve or to overcome all these crises and they could have done it in many ways okay manu the very famous lawgiver manu manu actually says that shudras and vaishyas should not be allowed to deviate from their caste rules sorry varna rules okay but the most effective way that kshatriyas and brahmanas found to overcome this crisis is to issue land grants this was actually done by kshatriyas all right kshatriyas what did they do they simply parceled out these lands to priests and you know, other officials etc etc in uh, lieu of their salary so what is the advantage here advantage is very simple if you parcel out all these lands the revenue collection from that land the law and order situation in that land etc is on the head of that particular beneficiary on that brahmana person or say that official correct so the king or the emperor is relieved of such functions so that beneficiary will take care of things in that unit in that land which was granted okay so this land grants had this idea okay the 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 major idea behind land grants was you know uh, to make sure the varna system was kept intact clear so eventually tribal people you know were also brought into brahmanical life in a more accelerated manner and they were also taught the culture and you know uh, say what it is to be an aryan etc etc the problem was when brahmanas were granted you know these villages and land grants all of these were mostly tax free okay and beneficiaries were allowed to govern the people within the area which was given to them even the government officials and retainers were not allowed to enter these villages without permission from the beneficiary so up to the 5th century ad the king or the you know emperor he had retained the right to punish criminals in these areas as well. okay so if there are some thieves or anything uh, even if that thief thief live in a you know a donated land still the king had the power to punish him but later on we see that it is actually the beneficiary who were authorized 
to punish all such criminal offenders. So the king basically lost a lot of his power once the system of land grants started to accelerate. Clear? So basically the power of king was heavily undermined. And from the end of Gupta period onwards, we see that such a kind of society emerges in a very accelerated manner. We see pockets of these, you know, uh, lands which are free from royal control in a highly multiplied fashion. We find more and more lands which were actually free from the official royal control. Obviously, the king is the, you know, uh, you know, uh, the supreme source of power. No doubt in that, king is the monarch. Obviously, but. Or, uh, for all practical purposes, the collection of revenue, imposition of punishments, uh, maintenance of law and order, etc., which was earlier up to the king, was now granted to the beneficiary of the land grant. Clear? And from the reign of Harshavardhana onwards, we also see that public officials were also paid in land revenue. This also we studied yesterday. Up till this point, it was the priests and you know certain very important personalities who were given land grants. But from Harshavardhana spirit, we see that almost all public officials were also given land, uh, you know, were paid using land revenues, not in cash. Clear, that is one of the reasons why we find very, very less number of coins in the period of Vardhanas and, you know, in the adjacent period. And finally, by the 7th century, there is a distinct evolution of something known as landlordism. And once this landlordism emerged, there is a clear devolution of central state authority, obviously. Clear? So these land grants led into a kind of feudal setup. So feudal setup means basically means landlordism. Clear? So a large number, a huge amount of power was, you know, finally in the hands of this landlord. The Vaishya and Shudra classes were basically oppressed by the landlord from now on. And these landlords eventually started to act as intermediaries between kings and uh, the lower sections. So here is the stage when we witness intermediaries in history. If you remember when we studied about Ashoka and all, we learned that during the time of Mauryans and uh, etc. Uh, the king you know, used to send royal agents to collect taxes and all. It was directly looked after by the monarchy. Right? But now, all those powers are parceled out to these landlords. So they became intermediaries between king and the subjects. Okay? So we see a clear devolution of central state authority during this period. Now, these land beneficiaries, you know, they, they cannot cultivate the entire land on their own. Now, I mean, they are given the land grant and these are basically, the beneficiaries basically are Brahmanas or say Kshatriyas in certain cases. But they don't go to the field and you know, plow all by themselves. In very earlier periods, yes, Brahmanas also took into agriculture. But later on, we studied that uh, in the later Vedic age onwards, uh, Brahmanas were not allowed to take the plow. Okay, They're not allowed to do these kinds of menial works. They were entrusted into lower Varnas. So cultivation was basically the job of peasants or sharecroppers who were you know, attached to the land. But these people did not have any ownership in the land. That is the paradox here. So the real owner of the land has particularly no, uh, you know, it is not associated with the practice of agriculture. And it is the, the, and the people who are into agriculture has no ownership on land. See the irony here? But that was how the society was in those times. So agriculture is, you know, were placed under the control of religious beneficiaries okay in to summarize that point we can say that the agriculturists who were basically the uh, vaishya classes and the laborers who were the shudra classes they were basically put under the control of religious beneficiaries mostly brahmanas from 6th century onwards these sharecroppers and peasants you know they particularly were asked to stay with within their land okay so in certain cases when these say uh, beneficiaries that is brahmanas or kshatriya beneficiaries when they overly oppressed the lower classes they tend to abandon the village and migrate to another village in search for a comparatively liberal life all right but from 6th century onwards these people were basically forced to stay within their allotted territory 
they were not allowed to leave their village clear so this era also witnesses a great undermining of mass mobility people were not allowed to move from abandoned one place and go to another they were supposed to stick within their village itself so huge restrictions on mobility were also imposed as a result of the practice of granting land grants we also witness decline of trade and towns same era okay we are the, the period we are talking is around 6th century ad that is the you know, era of concern here in this period we see a sharp decline in trade and uh, commerce we already looked into the reasons yesterday most important reasons being the byzantine empire finally learning the art of making silk this basically destroyed the silk route indian trade also collapsed a lot because india was also a major exporter of silk and you know india carried on some commerce with china and southeast asian countries and all but still arabs were the most flourishing people at this time arabs acted as intermediaries and they basically took over the uh, majority of profits so on and all indians basically shrank in the field of trade and economy this is best evidenced by the lack of any you know gold coins in india at this particular point of time we do not find many gold coins from you know uh, of this era that also points to the fact that the economy is not doing so well so if the trade is not flourishing and if if the economy is not doing so well obviously it will lead to decay of towns correct right a city cannot flourish without a proper economic condition if the economy falls down city will also decay obviously we have some evidences also say huan sang the chinese pilgrim he says that he actually went into certain areas which were supposed to be flourishing centers of buddhism and when he went there he was surprised to see that these areas were virtually deserted people just deserted those areas and you know went somewhere else these cities were supposed to be you know flourishing centers of buddhism so that also points to the fact that economic conditions in these times were not so much uh, you know positive now exports also there was restricted market for india's exports artisans and merchants you know who once lived out of these kinds of exports had to abandon this all uh, trade and all and had to go to you know country sites and practice agriculture clear i told you regarding uh, you know the romans putting ban on importing certain items from india once that happened the people who were you know living based on this export business they had to abandon all that and they had to find some kinds of you know some alternate means of livelihood right so a lot of artisans abandoned all those jobs and came into the field of agriculture so we see more and more people flocking into agriculture in these particular periods clear the reason is decline of trade and towns so once this started to happen condition in villages were not so much uh, you know peaceful or it's not it's not so much efficient why because earlier the arrangement was the village the rural folk did the agriculture and they sent all these food materials etc to the town folks and in return the town folks you know uh, uh, send you know uh, the oil salt spices cloth such commodities to rural area so that kind of urban rural give and take was what was going on in the ancient indian towns in these uh, these periods but once these towns collapsed and all these people flocked into the villages naturally what would have happened all these extra commodities that once used to reach the rural areas vanished so now it was up to the rural people to create all these on their own so the villages were basically forced to convert themselves into a self sufficient unit clear this gave rise to smaller units of production within the villages a lot of arts and crafts which were once the uh, you know jobs in towns actually shifted into a rural setup clear so most of these merchants and you know traders etc who lost their jobs they came into agriculture but not all of them some of them were actually very influential and they got appointed as managers of land and administration clear some of the wealthier ones they were actually appointed as managers of you know land administration etc etc 
and these merchants started to act as landlords okay so the role of merchants as landlords is actually linked with the decline of trade and towns in this period i hope you understood so those people who lost their you know export business so they had you know no choice but to take up agriculture but the wealthier and influential sections within the merchants they managed to get some favors and they got up certain other appointments as managers of land administration and so and so so a lot of these merchants actually became landlords eventually clear and this conversion also happened because of decline of trade and towns okay so now let's see what are the changes in varna system that happened at this time good evening satya good evening akshay uh, satya okay uh, we are talking about the condition present in every region of indian territory at the time or particular uh, we are speaking in general okay we are speaking in general about the 6th century era so uh, it's not like that in every region the same thing happened no obviously each region has its own story to tell but we are looking at a broader view overall indian subcontinent the conditions that existed in 6th century clear in specific areas obviously difference differences are there in certain areas it's completely different but in general we can say these things about 6th century and 7th century period in ancient india so changes in varna system all right so basically vaishya classes were pre, you know the peasants okay they were the agriculturists and the shudra class formed the laborers the menial laborers and these land grants which were given to brahmanas and other officials these created a section known as landlords all right and once this section called landlords were created the vaishyas who were once free peasants basically became something less their status in the society was now roughly equal to that of shudras okay earlier they had to pay the taxes to the king right the royal agents would come and collect the tax so no intermediary sort anything they were they were free cultivators they could cultivate and then they could you know pay a portion of it uh, of the production to the royal agents that's it but now there is an intermediary called landlord and when this landlord appeared the condition of vaishyas who were once free peasants further deteriorated and they became roughly equal to that of shudras clear and the frequent seizures of power and land grants gave rise to several categories of landed people so some changes had to be made in this society to you know deal with all these things okay i mean uh, the varna system itself is you know a bit bleak at this point of time i mean it exists but the status of different classes have you know uh, shifted in varying proportions so adequate changes had to be adopted in law books to accommodate the newly uh, formed landed classes to accommodate the new landlords to adapt to the changes in the society and so and so so formerly everything was you know graded according to the varnas brahmana kshatriya vaishya and shudra but now a person's possession of land is also very vital clear a person can be a vaishya and he could have been possessing you know a wide area of lands which means he is very wealthy a person could be a brahmana but he may not have a piece of land so he is very poor so rather than simply going by the social you know status based on varna now it became very necessary that a person's possession land possession should also be considered important all right women also women's conditions were also you know nothing good uh, anyhow earlier also women were treated as property and all and now also the same thing continued women were not allowed to inherit property and even when they were allowed they were only allowed a very small portion compared to male heirs so such bad treatment were continued as far as women were concerned all right and from the 7th century onwards we see that numerous castes were created because of varna sangra i already told you that plenty of new castes and sub castes etc started to be created a purana in 8th century actually states that thousands of mixed castes were produced by the connection of vaishya women with men of lower classes this also we see 
since the condition of Vaishyas became extremely, you know, or roughly equal to that of Shudra, thanks to the arrival of landlordism, we see that plenty of Vaishya women actually took on lower class husbands, lower caste husbands. Okay, I mean, there are a couple of two kinds of marriages known as Aniloma marriage and Pratiloma marriage. I think we have mentioned this in one of our classes a long time ago. So, Aniloma means an upper class man marrying a lower class woman. Okay, and Pratiloma means upper class woman marrying a lower class man. Okay, so due to this Varna Sangara and due to the shift in the status of these Varnas, we see that many Vaishya women actually started taking husbands from lower castes. We also see a lot of Brahm, uh, tribal people being accommodated into the Brahmanical society using the land grant technique. Okay, so this period, along with all these you know, uh, social and economic changes, also witness considerable developments in the field of culture. So around the 6th and 7th centuries, we see the formation of a lot of cultural units, which eventually becomes different, different states. Right, just think about India, modern day India. The first state to form is Andhra. Correct. The first state to form on a linguistic basis was Andhra. And the basics was uh, you know, language. So language is something that is identified with a culture correct so these kinds of cultural units started to show up back in 6th and 7th century onwards the formation starts then not as in the present form or anything but still as distinct cultural units with regional uh, you know commonality since the 7th century we see again a very remarkable development in linguistic history of india through the birth of abhramsa Historians believe that Abhapramsa is the final stage of Middle Indo-Aryan uh, language. Okay, Indo-Aryan language family includes Sanskrit and you know, Prakrit and all these things. And Abhapramsa is considered as the final stage of the Middle Indo-Aryan language. And this is seen to have been originated in this point in history. Most of the Jaina literature were actually written in Abhapramsa. I, I won't say most of them. But at least some of them. Okay, most of them were written in another uh, language, which is a variant of Prakrit, named as Artha Magadhi. We already talked about that when we studied Jainism. But Abhabramsa uh, was very well used to produce many Jaina literatures around this period. Buddhist writings also, you know, uh, in the Eastern Indian areas and all, uh, we see that Bengali, Assami, Maithili, Odia, Hindi, all these languages were used for Buddhist writings as well. Jaina works also so some other languages such as uh, Gujarati, Rajasthani. So all these are you know cultural developments that happened around this period. South India also say plenty of new languages. Tamil is the oldest South Indian language but Kannada also started to form around this period. Telugu and Malayalam came very late. Okay in the South Indian among the South Indian languages Tamil is the oldest one. Kannada started forming around 6th and 7th century AD and then uh, Malayalam and Telugu very late comparatively. So all these are basically attributed to the breakup of Gupta Empire. All these changes. Clear. Once the major Gupta Empire broke up, it led to decline of trade. We already discussed this in the you know, uh, de decline of Gupta Empire. So that contributed or facilitated the decline of trade and this decline of trade led to lack of communication. Okay, if the trade exists, then there is constant movement of goods and people from one part to other and vice versa. But once trade declined, it led to lack of communication. And this lack of communication led to growth of regional languages. Clear? If you remember, consider Ashokan period in Maurya, in the Mauryan Empire, the entire empire had one common language that is Prakrit. I mean, we have inscriptions of Aramic and Karoshti, etc, etc, and different parts. Yes, but even then, Prakrit was the mainland language throughout the Mauryan Empire. Right? Gupta period also, we see Prakrit and Sanskrit. But after the collapse of Gupta Empire, due to this lack of communication, regionalism began to become very vital. And that led to the development of many regional languages, which we are already mentioned. Which we have already mentioned. 
clear so regional scripts also began to become more and more important from this period onwards many scripts started forming around this period this period is also very vital as far as religion is concerned okay the bhakti and tantricism happened around this period we already spoke about bhakti in detail in previous class you have to understand that it all the major changes happened in this time 7th century onwards bhakti cult spread all over south india the bhakti movement in ancient india actually started in south india alvars and nayanars were the earlier proponents of this cult and it then came to uh, you know north india in the form of vaishnavism and uh, shaivism and you know such other things all right so bhakti you know it basically implies a total surrender to the devotees of god correct right the devotees were you know supposed to completely completely surrender themselves in front of god that kind of devotion and that kind of arrangement is basically the basis of bhakti true right we all know that and this can actually be compared to the social setup in india at that time in society there was you know complete dependence of tenants on their landowners correct the tenants who worked in this land they were completely depended on the landowners just like a devotee was you know completely surrendered to the god so the bhakti also has a lot to do with the social setup that existed at that time just just as the tenants offered and provided various services to the landlord and then received land and protection as a kind of favor from him a similar relation came to be established between individual and god that is true in a you know a land grant there is a landlord and a tenant the tenant you know in uh, they he used to do all the you know menial works in the land and in return for that he can expect something from the landlord same goes for bhakti total surrender to god and you know you believe that god will grant you your wishes or you know whatever clear yeah. so this bhakti cult is basically very much comparable to the social setup that existed in the same period tantricism also came around around this period and it it can also be seen uh, through the lens of socio economic changes in ancient india at this point of time this is a transition phase okay this is a transition phase from uh, ancient to medieval india clear this transition starts in north india actually in general it starts in the gangetic basin and all and then it's uh, not exactly gangetic basin it starts in hilly regions and all initially and then spreads to gangetic basin and then spreads to all other parts of the country all right but in general we can attribute all these changes to the indian subcontinent or the indian system in the later ancient indian phases the one thing that was very positive about tantricism was that it admitted everybody to its order earlier women and shudras were not so much allowed in you know brahmanical rituals and all but tantricism was open to everybody women shudras etc etc the thing is unlike other religions tantricism was very much emphasized on the use of magic rituals clear in bhakti and uh, you know in, in medieval india we studied about bhakti and sufi movements there are a lot of mysticism and etc associated with it but still magical rituals are a part of tantricism not anything else all right and basically the idea was tantricism is intended to satisfy material desires of the devotees from for physical possessions and to cure diseases and injuries suffered by them. that was the at main goal clear yeah? you do all these magical rituals and in return you would be gaining some materialistic desires that's it it's not like you will attain salvation or anything most often tantricism was the method chosen for achieving materialistic gains to cure a disease or to say have some physical possessions clear so that uh, these are parts of tantra so say if uh, if uh, you know uh, as far as student is concerned uh, you know he might uh, pray to god and do magical rituals in order to gain good marks so that is you know doing something to achieve something else which is materialistic that is that is that was the arrangement of tantricism and tantricism obviously you know arose as a consequence of large scale admission of aboriginal people into brahmanical society 
So induction of these aboriginals or say tribal people into the Brahmanical society brought in a lot of customs which were theirs into the Brahmanical order. All right, just you know consider this. You you know a group of people who were living as tribals had their own faith, their own culture, their own beliefs. One fine day, you know, or gradually, when they are inducted into a completely different social setup, they won't completely abandon their earlier life. Right? Some part of it will always remain, right? And they will always bring that part with them into the newly, you know, admitted setup. And this is how tantricism emerges in the society. It emerged because of the induction of Aboriginal people into Brahmanical society. And once this started happening, it spread through all religions, Jainism, Buddhism, Shaivism, Vaishnavism. Clear? Vajrayana Buddhism is the best example of Tantricism in Buddhism. So this, uh, this method basically spread in almost all the important religions in ancient India. So to conclude this chapter, you know, to summarize this entire chapter, we can say as, as follows. In 6th and 7th centuries and then onwards, we see a lot of developments in almost all walks of life, almost all walks of Indian society, Indian polity. Clear? So ancient India basically transformed into medieval India. That transformation phase is happening in the 6th and 7th century AD. Some of the important features associated with this period is the domination of landlords, just like what happened in Europe. Okay, we can compare Indian system with Europe also in this era. In Europe also, we see the rise of landlords. There are differences, obviously, but these are certain similarities, at least superficially, these are similar. In Indian setup, the society is feudal and it is dominated by landlords. In European system also, society is feudal dominated by landlords. But uh, difference is that in European system, there existed the slavery. Okay, European landlordism is completely different. You have the manor, you have the serfdom, you have slavery. But India is something different. Okay, both the Roman and the Gupta empires were actually attacked by Hunas. So what is the difference or what is the cause of this difference between Indian setup and European setup? In India, the Gupta empires, you know, uh, were collapsing and towards the end of their rule. And in Europe, Romans were, you know, facing troubles. They were, you know, facing the last uh, period in their rule. Both these people were actually attacked by Hunas. Indians were also attacked. Uh, Romans were also attacked in some point in history. The thing is, in the Roman Empire, the independent peasants, they were basically compelled for self-preservation and protection from these Hunas. These Hunas are Central Asian tribal people, okay? And they, uh, you know, they used to plunder and loot and all. Clear? So in order to protect themselves from these Hunas, the people in Europe, the common man in Europe, basically had to do the self-preservation and protection. And in order to achieve that, they surrendered their freedom to the landlords. Clear? And they became serfs. But in India, this did not happen. Huna invasion in India did not lead to the formation of serfdom. Indian society did not at any point in history employ slaves in productive activities in any large scale. I hope you remember this. Most of the productive activities were done by say Shudras and Vaishyas and all, but never by slaves as such. Slavery existed, but no slave system existed in India. Unlike in Europe. All right. So just again, just like, uh, you know, uh, lands were granted to Brahmanas and all in India, in Europe also we see that similar land grants were made to churches. So this is another similarity as far as land grant goes. Both in India and Europe, we can see a clear trend of decline in artisanal and commercial activity after 6th century. Again, trade and commerce declined, not just in India. In Indian setup, we already learned what caused all these things. In Europe also the same thing happened. They lost the you know the trade with China and all because they already developed uh, the knowledge to you know do all these things. And then there were obstructions in Central Asia owing to certain other developments. Then the major empire collapsed. Okay, the Roman Empire completely collapsed. All these led to decline in trade and all. Okay, and then we also witness agrarian expansion. Rise of landlordism is always associated with agrarian expansion. 
happened in India, happened in Europe. So, to conclude, we can say that emergence of landlords as a powerful class became a cons uh, conspicuous feature of social, economic, and political landscape after the end of ancient period in both Europe and India. That is true. From now onwards, okay, when we uh, we already studied medieval India, so you already know this. In medieval India also, these landlords play a very, very important role. Eventually, in modern India also, we studied about Zamindas and all, right? All, they, all these people are, in a way, landlords. Correct? So, from this point in history onwards, from 6th and 7th century AD onwards, we see that landlords play a very important role in shaping India's economy, social society, polity, etc., etc. Okay? So, that is the end of the first chapter. And uh, I hope you have got a broad idea about the shift from ancient India to medieval India. Now we are going to see another chapter that is sequence of social changes. We will be discussing more or less the same thing which we have already seen in the first chapter. But we are going to see it in a more sequential order and we are going to focus on certain important areas as such. That's it. We already, I think all of you would already know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, you can use this as a revision or you know just to polish your memory. Okay, before that, let me see if there are any questions. Reasons for that much influence of Tantrism in almost every prominent religion at that time? Okay, one of the most important reason is that Tantrism was open to everybody, especially Shudras and women. Condition of Shudras and women were almost always bad as far as Brahmanism goes. And Brahmanism, there was a revival of Brahmanism. Buddhism and Jainism were already you know, very much in decline. So, Brahmanism, Brahmanism was the major... Uh, religion that was going on, Brahmanism or Hinduism, whatever, both are same. Okay, so acceptance of women uh, or, or acceptance of the neglected sessions in the society basically brought them lots and lots of followers. That is the main reason of Tantrism. Also, materialistic benefits. Tantrism offered material gains, uh, you know, through magical and other things. Clear magical rituals, etc. Uh, they, again, look, concepts such as nirvana, salvation, these are not for ordinary people. Just think about it. Even now, even in now present day India, if we think about it, okay, I mean, uh, can we think about salvation at this point of time? No, we are thinking about clearing the civil service examination. So, these the, the goals of common man is basically very much materialistic in nature. Clear? Higher philosophies like, you know, soul, God, universe and uh, such philosophical concepts are those are not for ordinary people so when uh, tantrism came up with such materialistic gains they were able to you know basically influence common man common people which were the majority sections in any religion clear so that also added to the influence of tantrism in almost all religions in india so sequence of social changes okay that is the next chapter small chapter introduction uh let's okay this chapter again is presented in a very sequential fashion okay in the first slide itself we can see what happened from prehistoric age all the way to medieval india in the pre-vedic times we do not have any kind of written materials that which can be used to study the society that is true people in the stone ages okay i mean uh, way back even before harappa uh, in the pre-Vedic times and all, we do not find any kind of written records as such. We learned that people lived in small groups in hilly areas, etc. in the Paleolithic age. They were hunters, gatherers, etc. All these knowledge are available to us through archaeological sources. We find certain stone tools. Okay, from that we identify that the people used to hunt and do things. Similarly, certain paintings in certain caves. Tells us that the people, you know, used to live in small groups, hunted animals, etc, etc. So, no written records, but some archaeological sources, that's it. But eventually, as time went on, man learned to produce food and live in houses towards the end of Stone Age. Towards the end of Stone Age, human beings finally started to settle down. They began to, you know, produce food on their own. That means agriculture is again in the picture. And also, they started to use metal. Right, towards the end of Stone Age. That is why it is, we say that it is the end of Stone Age. Because the metallic age is going to begin. 
in the neolithic and calcolithic communities they the people lived in uplands and you know proximity to hills and rivers why because iron is not yet a main feature iron has not yet been commonly used copper was the main metal and that was not enough to clear thick forests in gangetic basin and also people obviously had to live in highlands and uh, say river valleys etc etc correct but gradually you know uh, once iron etc came into both or say uh, maybe even before that people you know started slowly moving into various uh, you know areas and inland regions etc etc uh, they began to grow in other fields okay in, maybe as far as metal is concerned they only know about uh, say copper tin cotton bronze etc etc but in the field of lit uh, literacy or say writing similarly in the field of town planning etc etc they began to become more and more learned and you know experienced and this led to the growth of the first civilization in india that is that of harappa harappan civilization happened and a clearly for the first time in indian history we see a clearly established urban society in harappa and then harappan society civilization one uh, you know uh, after some period it completely collapsed and after harappa disappeared urbanism did not appear in india for about 100 1500 years that is also correct after harappa there is a break in indian history so that is the sequence from no written records and you know entirely having to rely on archaeological uh, evidences by the time of harappa we have clearly you know written records and you know writings and a uh, very major development in urbanism etc etc although harappan script is yet to be deciphered still they have a script and they have um, you know written some things that we are not able to understand now starting with tribal and pastoral phase okay the earlier phases from the time of rigveda onwards we can find useful written texts that is true okay rigvedic period onwards i mean for best example rigveda rigveda is the oldest textbook as far as uh, you know india is concerned or indo european family language family is concerned rigveda is one of the oldest textbooks ever created so from that time onwards rigvedic society onwards we have you know written materials available to us clear and from these materials we have learned that rigvedic society despite knowing agriculture was primarily pastoral agriculture was secondary in rigvedic society we already learned all these things right? so i am going to go a bit fast so they were primarily pastoral so naturally semi nomadic and their principal possession was cattle and horses okay i mean again no surprises there it is a pastoral society so cattle were cattle and horses were the primary possessions so a wealthy person was known as a gomat wars were conducted for cattle and it was known as gavishti similarly the raja okay or the you know principal person responsible for the entire clan it was he was known as gopa or gopati again gau means cow so it everything associated with cattle similarly the term used for daughter was duhitra duhitra means one who milks so it was a daughter who you know used to milk the cow and so she was known by the term duhitra so it was a pastoral society centralized on cattle and uh, horse cattle rearing was thus the primarily uh, sorry uh, principal source of livelihood so people were you know barely able to produce anything over and above their barest subsistence agriculture at this point of time was subsistence agriculture it was never commercial primary activity was pastoral so agriculture is still very very primitive clear so the main income that they got was not through agriculture or anything it was mainly through spoils of war one and tributes given to the king clear the kings the only source of income to the kings were basically spoils of war and tributes paid by the common man to the king which was at this point of time voluntary named as bali later on bali became obligatory or mandatory but at this point of time in vedic society bali was a voluntary tribute paid by the common man to kings and all clear but later on it became very much uh, uh, say obligatory periodic sacrifices also provided very important occasions you know for distributing all these gifts and wealth to the tribal people but still the lion's share of this 
booty. Okay, the, uh, the lion's share of the spoils of war or the loot was basically kept by the upper sections, priestly classes and kshatriyas. Right? I mean, once this you know loot is conducted by the tribe, the you know the entire thing is actually kept by the king or the clan leader, and he later on festive occasions divides this to the tribal people to all the you know uh, persons in the tribe. But during this division, the major portion of his, it is kept by himself and by the priestly classes who performed all the you know festive rituals and all. And this disparity in sharing the loot basically led to unequal distribution and rise of distinction and hierarchy in the society. We have already learned this. This is the first instance of that kind of classification. First instance of, you know, uh, moving away from an egalitarian setup is seen during this time. Clear? Unequal distribution of war booty. So ordinary members of the tribe, you know, they used to have, you know, get a small share known as Amsha or Bhaga. That's it. Nothing more than that. The lion's share was kept by the upper, you know, the uh, clan leader as well as the priest. But even then, society on the whole was tribal, pastoral, semi-nomadic and egalitarian. Okay, even now we can say it is still egalitarian because we do not see, you know, any other kind of inequality other than what I have already mentioned. So still, for all practical purposes, the society is very much egalitarian. Clear? So the spoils of war, war was basically the main source of income or revenue. Cattle and women slaves were also offered as gifts. This is also something we have, that we have already seen. Cattle was also the you know chief source of income or the chief marker of wealth. And women slaves were also given as gifts during this period. So, Rigvedic society did not have a serving order. That is another important point that you have to remember. Clear? In later Vedic, uh, say post-Vedic and later Vedic era, we see that once the Varna system solidifies, Shudra serves as the serving class. Correct? Shudras are the, basically the people who conduct the menial labor. But in Vedic setup, in Rigvedic society, there is no group of people who are classified as serving order. True, right? In the Varna system, the job of Shudras is basically to serve the three upper Varnas. Correct? That was the role of Shudras. But such a serving order is absent in Rigvedic society. Very important for prelims. Don't forget. Now, let's see agriculture and the origin of upper orders. Okay, so now we have already witnessed the beginning of that, you know, inequality in the society. And now we are going to see how this, you know, solidified and even eventually led to clear cut stratifications. Okay, before that, let me see if any questions. Okay, no questions. So I'm continuing. Uh, so, you know, earlier, when the Vedic people moved from, you know, Afghanistan and Punjab region into the, you know, North Indian region, that is Uttar Pradesh and all, they began to become agriculturists. Okay, I mean, fertile soil, you know, Ganges basin full of rivers, etc, etc. Irrigation is also very much easy. And, you know, founding of iron uh, also helped them in, you know, agriculture. So, they became agriculturists. And this actually led to land having very, very importance in a person's life. Earlier, cattle was the marker of wealth, but now onwards, we see that land is the marker of wealth. And this is the base for the emergence of territorial chiefdoms. Territory or land became primary. Clear? So, in the later Vedic era, peasant was unable to contribute to the rise of trade and towns. And this feature was conspicuous in the age of Buddha also. Peasants were, you know, basically, you know, suppressed further down. They were taken from lower classes and all. And uh, they did not actually contribute directly anymore into the rising of, you know, uh, towns and trade. They were basically the rural folk from this point of time onwards. They used to do the menial works. Clear? In the later Vedic society, use iron on a very limited scale. But use of metallic money was unknown. Again, very important for prelims. Later Vedic society already knew iron and they used iron also. But even then, metallic money was unknown to them. 
where the communities had established neither taxation nor professional army. Why? Because even now, agriculture is not that much expanded. Agriculture is there, obviously. That is the one of the reasons why land became very primary and territorial states started showing up. But even now, the produce is not enough in order to impose a well-organized taxation system. Clear? So without proper taxation, there is no adequate revenue for the king to maintain a professional standing army. So we do not see any kind of standing army or taxation system even in the Vedic communities. Clear? So uh, the tribal peasantry formed the army during this time. There is no standing army as such. So the common man, whenever you have to go for a war, the civilians were basically assembled. The, it was a peasant army as such. That is why in later Vedic period, peasantry was known by the term Bala. Bala means force. So peasantry, peasantry basically served as the army. Clear? In the later Vedic phase as well. We also see wooden plowshare, similarly indiscriminate killing of cattle, etc. in the name of sacrifices and all. These two reasons basically force the peasants to produce only a very limited quantity. Okay, lack of uh, you know, number of uh, the cattle as well as wooden plowshare. There is no iron plowshare as of now and cattle are all you know, killed indiscriminately for sacrificial purposes and all. So all these hampered developments in agriculture. So the production was bare, you know, bare minimum and for subsistence only. Not enough to have a properly organized taxation system. All right. So rajas were expected to extend agriculture. Clear. Kings. Okay, or now the land has become very important. So it was up to the king to make sure that more and more land came into agriculture. Only then can he get more and more revenue. Okay, so this is a period when we see that even kings take themselves into agriculture. There are evidences that even the kings used to go to agricultural lands and plough. Clear? So this period, in the later Vedic phase, we see that the gap between Vaishya and Rajanya or Kshatriya class closes down. Clear? That gap or the wedge decreases. Vaishyas are the primarily agriculturist classes. Shudras are not allowed in agriculture in these phases. Okay, if you remember, Shudras are allowed agriculture in Ashogan, uh, sorry, in Mauryan phase only. That is a particular feature in Mauryan period. Artha Shastra mentions that the one of the striking changes that happened in Mauryan system at that time was allowing Shudras as agriculturists. Uh, but in these phases, agriculture was done by Vaishyas. But in order to bring more and more land under agriculture, even the king was ready to go down into agricultural fields and till himself. So the gap between Kshatriyas and Vaishyas narrowed a lot in this time. All right. And the, uh, uh, during this time, uh, kings can, could not grant land without the consent of tribal peasantry. Clear. The village as well as uh, say uh, village elders, tribal peasantry, etc. had a say in the land. So the kings could not parcel out lands to different people at this time. This is one of the reasons why we do not see land grants at this point of time. Okay, because the land does not belong to the king. I mean, although he is the you know, uh, source of power, still, if he has to, you know, allot a land to someone else, then he need the permission from tribal peasantry, without which he could not transfer the ownership of land. All right. So in the post Vedic times, Okay, we already, we, so far what were the, what we talked about was the later Vedic phases and Vedic phases. In the post Vedic phase, okay, so what is the particular character of this post Vedic phase or what is the difference between post Vedic phase and Vedic phase? The most important differences that actually, you know, is very much exclusive to post Vedic phase is, uh, actually divided into three. One is Aryanization, two Ionization, three Urbanization. These three features are the most important changes that happened or that led to the beginning of post Vedic times. Aryanization, Ionization, Urbanization. Aryanization you already know, spread of Aryan languages, you know, dominance of upper orders, subjugation of women, 
okay and uh, also the term arya was used to denote only the three upper classes you know the dvijas brahmana kshatriyas and vaishyas this is aryanization ionization again very much uh, obvious uh, spread of iron tools and all steel tools starting to come up this revolutionized the area of agriculture crafts etc etc led to more more agricultural lands uh, coming in and once the you know amount of agriculture and production increased uh, revenue also increased which enabled the kings to maintain large armies all these are the features of ionization finally urbanization or the growth of towns because of the flourishing agriculture because of this you know standing army etc etc and uh, because of the flourishing income and revenue trade and commerce also began to become very very uh, important traders and artisans played a very vital role their activities also led to huge incomes into the state treasury and overall many many towns emerged in this period so urbanization ionization and urbanization are very key features of post vedic times all right but these had a lot of drawbacks as well this is the phase when we see a complete transformation of a comparatively egalitarian vedic society into a caste divided social order around 5th century that is true right vedic society although it had certain kinds of you know uh, inequalities still the comparatively equal uh, egalitarian society completely was you know replaced by a uh, caste divided social order in the post vedic times later vedic times itself it started and uh, in the post vedic by the time of post vedic society uh, society it was completely solidified in the vedic times you know people used to cultivate their fields with the assistance of family members only that also we learned in one of our previous classes agricultural land you know basically a family owned it as such and uh, it was the family members who assisted in the agriculture there is nothing called a wage earner or anything because you know that system did not exist the people in the family itself take care of all the jobs however slaves and wage earners engaged in cultivation became a very much regular feature in the age of buddha onwards clear so from the 5th century bc onwards or say from the buddha period onwards say 3 3rd century bc and all we find that slave slaves and wage earners become very very prominent part of the society they conducted their uh, activities uh, uh, in the indian society until this point of time we do not have any kind of a system called wage earners why because family themselves took to care of agricultural activities nobody external was allowed in okay but now onwards we see that these kinds of new categories are also made by and large slaves in ancient india were meant to undertake domestic work clear earlier if you again remember slaves were also not allowed in agricultural fields they were actually initially they were mostly allotted for home uh, domestic works only agricultural lands were you know uh, allowed uh, allotted to shudras etc only from the mauryan period so up till that period uh, the uh, slaves and all were basically confined to domestic work with uh, within the house okay it was they were not allowed in the agricultural fields and all but anyway in this economy in this period we see that production has enlarged comparatively and uh, they were able to produce much more than what was necessary for subsistence and obviously because of this huge production part of it was collected by the princes and priests etc etc and our tax collectors were sent by royals clear and if in order to collect this tax you know you have to first convince the people that they they have to obey this system they have to obey the uh, you know orders of raja etc in order to attain certain things right just think about it one fine day you are saying that tomorrow onwards you have to pay me this much tax so if they have to pay that tax to me then i have to convince them that they are going to benefit from whatever is happening right otherwise would you just part away a part of your production to someone some random person no right so it is important to convince people of the necessity of obeying the raja paying him taxes and offering the gifts to priests and it is this necessity that led to the formation of 
varna system all right it is this necessity that led to the formation of varna system and the varna system was finally devised and solidified in this point of time the twice born can be called as citizens that is the dvijas okay brahmana kshatriya vaishya these three categories were allowed to be called as citizens and the shudras were considered as non citizens they were you know from the beginning they were neglected all right and from this point onwards as i have mentioned earlier brahmanas were not allowed to take plow okay this this is the point this the beginning of the varna system is the point in history from where brahmanas separate themselves away and away from all kinds of manual laborers all the menial manual you know lab, uh, labor was parceled out to untouchables and you know shudras etc etc and they you know brahmanas basically considered that the more a person withdrew from physical labor the purer he is clear <laughs> so basically kind of a you know white collar job okay no no more blue, blue collar jobs uh, it's better to be a white collar person all right so this attitude started from the time of uh, the beginning of varna system the, the the more a person withdrew from physical labor the purer he became all right so vaishyas you know they they worked as peasants herdsmen artisans and later traders etc etc and they were actually the chief tax payers clear brahmanas and kshatriyas brahmanas you know completely isolated themselves from all the menial works the kshatriyas went into administrative works they also are not engaged in any kind of production vaishyas were the major sources of all sorts of revenue in the country in the society all right so ancient textbooks uh during this period emphasize that kshatriyas cannot prosper without the support of brahmanas and brahmanas cannot prosper without the support of kshatriyas this arrangement also started around this time all right in order to achieve that validation kshatriyas need brahmanas achieve that validation to rule kshatriyas need brahmanas and brahmanas need kshatriyas to get a lots and lots of gifts and you know donations and all without having to do all the manual work so that kind of arrangement started around this time now we are going to see the social crisis and the rise of landed classes any questions urbanization led to the formation of state which led to divisions in the society for its uh, authority yes i mean that is the order in which things happen but uh, it is we, it's not exactly the same we can't say that urbanization led to the formation of state okay uh, formation of state happened because of these reasons i mentioned so far such as say uh, territory becoming important agriculture agriculture is the beginning is the basis of all these transformations and then once iron plowshare was uh, invented and you know agriculture became more and more productive a taxation system came into being and from this time onwards you know uh, there are a lot of much more surplus revenue started to come up this is actually what led to the formation of a pure state system because king was able to maintain a strong army he was able to take care of various other activities in the kingdom clear and then in order to have this taxation system you have to convince people that they have to pay tax and that necessity led to the formation of varna system clear so the you know disparity in the society is not just based on varna system social inequality was based on varna system but economic inequality was there even before that if you remember even earlier itself there was that disparity in dividing the war loot that they got the clans got true right similarly uh, even after the taxation system came up certain classes were exempted from paying taxes and all and certain classes were you know forced to pay taxes correct so these kinds of disparity so the two forms of disparities existed one is social and one is economic social disparity started from varna system economic disparity was there even before that all right so social crisis and the rise of landed classes so in the gangetic plains uh, there occurred a successive series of large states okay main, most of the mo major states in those times were basically formed in gangetic basin because of the obvious reasons okay very fertile area uh, plain area rivers all right 
forests were cleared and brought into agriculture etc etc full of you know metallic ores and you know such other reasons around first and second century ad we also witness a booming trade and urbanism and art also flourish as never before all these are true okay consider the mauryan period and all then you will understand booming trade urbanism art also coming up in a substantial scale from 3rd century ad onwards social formation was affected by a very deep crisis known as kali age this also we already spoke in the first chapter kali age led to what is known as varna sankara or the intermixing of different caste and classes and this led to something known as the importance of danda or coercive measures that is what i told you earlier the lawgiver manu says that the vaishyas and you know, shudras should not be allowed to deviate from their duties it is the duty of the kshatriyas to make sure about this so using coercion these classes should be you know obliged to follow the established social setup so kali the age of kali should be controlled by the king okay and king was championed as the upholder and restorer of the varna system so that happens in 3rd century so state in order to avoid all these things state found it very you know uh, the king had to do all the job okay all these are supposed to be on the head of the king in order to you know ease things state found it convenient to assign land revenues directly to priests military chiefs administrators etc okay now it's on their head i am parceling out this land to them they can collect revenue from that area but they have to maintain law and order and they have to maintain uh, you know the varna system etc etc as such clear so the raja usurped this power and obliged the leading member of the community by granting the land into them these beneficiaries were also empowered to maintain law and order so the entire you know the upholder of varna system the job basically was parceled out to these people obviously still kshatriya was the person who was supposed to maintain all these things but king tried to parcel out most of these jobs to the beneficiaries out of land grant clear and this is how the fiscal and administrative problems were resolved now the king is free from all the you know issues brahmanas and kshatriyas can you know as uh, the other officials can collect all the taxes they can you know forcibly collect these taxes pay a small you know tribute to the king so the fiscal issue is solved administrative problem is also solved law and order will also be taken care of by them the king did not have to directly take care of all these things clear and more and more taxes were started to be imposed once the tribal areas also came into the brahmanical order again due to the expansion of agriculture and expansion of land grants so land grants uh, to brahmanas and others spread the agricultural calendar diffused the knowledge of ayurveda medicine and thus contributed to the overall cereal production that is also correct this is one of the positives i mentioned this in the previous class although we might think that this cause landlordism etc etc and you know further oppression of shudras and all still giving out these lands to brahmanas helped in some ways to better the agriculture because brahmanas were the educated sessions and they had you know much more knowledge about you know seasons and you know uh, ayurvedic medicine etc etc which all benefited agriculture also dissemination of the art of writing use of prakrit and sanskrit also bettered because brahmanas were given charge of all these things so the through these land grants civilization spread into all parts of the country including very deep south and far east we studied the same yesterday in south india how brahmanization came how things changed in south india same goes for eastern india we also studied eastern india yesterday orissa bengal assam all right so anyway earlier itself you know due to, uh, with some traders and missionaries and all south india and east india knew some things about iranization but by now through land grants it is properly established clear and a large number of aboriginal peasants you know uh, who were inducted into the brahmanical system they were also ranked as shudras vaishyas lost their position as independent peasants and therefore in the post gupta times economically and socially the gap between vaishya and shudra narrowed we already discussed this in the first chapter 
okay this is when vaishya community i mean rise of landlordism causes vaishya community to lose their status and vaishyas and shudras become more and more closer together in social status clear so land grants basically cause the emergence of the class of landlords change the society into a feudal character but even then the position of women etc were still deteriorated clear upper class women i mean lower class women could work in field and all so they were uh, comparatively better but as far as upper caste women were concerned their condition was still very much miserable nothing improving as far as they are concerned to conclude this chapter we can summarize that we cannot give us you know single label to the entire ancient india okay we can't say that it was stagnant we can't say that it was completely egalitarian we can't say that it was completely you know unequal clear so it is not easy to brand a particular tag to ancient india because there is there are several stages of evolution in ancient india from a food gathering society in paleolithic age which was succeeded by neolithic and chalcolithic communities then harappan civilization was established and urban towns came up then we see a break in our history which was very late followed by horse users and cattle herders that is a rigvedic society which was pastoral in nature and then came the class divided society in the post vedic times varna system emerged correct the social system you know worked well in the uh, buddha times till the gupta period and towards the end of gupta period and in the post gupta period land grants and uh, etc were given in a large fashion and landlords emerged as a popular section or, or as an important section in the society and this undermined the position of vaishyas and also modified the varna system clear so in the ancient indian period we see a lot of changes if we take one by one individually it's no it's not a too big a change but we look at in a very you know broader fashion we see that from a pastoral society from a nomadic society things has changed a lot and by the post gupta periods we have something called landlords which is something that we can't even imagine in the stone age clear so in the big picture there are a lot of changes to the final chapter of the final session in ancient india that is legacy in science and civilization this is a comparatively bigger chapter but um, most are point based it's a bit dry chapter no story as such uh, very helpful for your prelims all right so let's begin the final chapter from the final session of ancient india legacy in science and civilization before that any questions no all right so let's start religion and formation of social classes all right so you know we have this very common uh, quote that necessity is the mother of all inventions right necessity is the mother of all inventions that we all know so earlier in prehistoric age and all man's confrontation with nature is what led to a lot of developments especially in technology science etc etc clear so actually human beings began agriculture as early as 7th millennium bc okay very primitive agriculture okay not in the modern sense or anything but very primitive they took advantage of fertile fertile soil timely rain you know etc which were considered as you know gifts of nature but although they knew the know how of agriculture they did not know how to tackle natural hazards or you know fire or you know such other things so they considered all these things as you know religious or superstitious things okay rather than going behind science people took upon these as superstitions okay if you remember uh you know rain is associated with indra fire is associated with the god of agni water is associated with the god of uh, varuna clear so those things which were not able to be explained were basically given a superstitious or say a religious character it is same for all religions not just brahmanism but hindu jainism buddhism christianity whatever some of them try to be logical but even then when they meet a crystal okay when when they uh, meet something that is not they are not able to explain they attributed it to some supernatural or say superstitious uh, you know person 
or superstitious uh, phenomenon. Clear? So religion had a very peculiar influence in the society of India. Varna system and you know uh, or the Varna laws enjoyed the sanction of both the state and religion. Varna system came up because of state and once the religions also started coming up they also sanctioned Varna system. Although Buddhism strong you know strongly voiced against Varna system and all still Buddha or the Buddhists had to accept that Varna system existed or is a very, very much a part of Indian society. I told you that Buddhism basically voiced against Varna system but they were not able to bring about any kind of in substantial change in the Varna based society. Clear. So each Varna was not just given you know, a social recognition but also they had a ritualistic recognition. Varnas or social classes and jatis and or castes were made hereditary by law and religion. Also, I do not have to explain all these things. You already know this. Clear? The producing and the laboring classes, that is Vaishyas and Shudras, they were disarmed. And gradually they were pitted one against each other. So that they won't unite against the upper class. Okay, I mean, uh, in numbers, Shudras and Vaishyas are far more than Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. Far more. So, if the Shudras and Vaishyas unite against Kshatriyas, then or, or say Brahmanas, then entire thing collapses instantly. So, to prevent that, what did the upper classes do? They made the lower classes fight against each other. Clear? They made subdivisions in, within the Shudras and within the Vaishyas and all and pitted one against other. So, they will you know, continue in fighting and we will take care of the bigger things. Exactly what British did. Britishers did the same thing in India, divide and rule, right? So we can see the predecessors of that in Indian history, ancient India as well. Not exactly the same, but you know, at least we can say so. Uh, and you know, to some extent, uh, you know, this was one way, okay, pitting one against another was one method in which it was achieved. Then they also did the same uh, using certain, uh, say, superstitions or certain beliefs. For example, Bhagavad Gita. Okay, consider Bhagavad Gita, very important textbook for Hinduism and there are a lot of good things about it. But Bhagavad Gita taught people that people should lay down their lives in defense of their own dharma rather than adopt the dharma of others which would prove to be dangerous. Think about this. Okay, Bhagavad Gita is basically supposed to have been the God's verses, right? It is Krishna who is giving out all the messages, right? In Bhagavad Gita for uh, towards Arjuna. So Bhagavad Gita taught people that people should lay down their lives in defense of their own dharma rather than adopt the dharma of others which would prove dangerous. Which basically means what? Varna system has to be upheld. Correct. We can interpret it in such a way. Varna system should be upheld. Even these books were designed in a way to make sure that the society was intact and it did not, the entire system did not break down one fine day. So the lower orders worked hard in their firm belief that they would deserve a better life in the next world or in the next birth. Okay, these are God's verses. So basically people, you know, believe in all that, these things, obviously, even now, modern day also, we believe in God and all. Okay, I mean, or at least the, again, not the atheist maybe, but majority of the people believe in God. So they believe that you know if they do their jobs as said in all these books, they will achieve salvation or they will have a better life in the next birth or in the afterlife. Clear? So they you know try to be a part of the Varna system and do their dharma according to Varna system rather than going against it. This was also a method used by the upper classes to preserve the Varna order. Clear? So there was no necessity to coerce the lower, lower order people to uphold uh, you know, Varna system. Clear? No, uh, there was no need to put any kind of force or forcibly make the lower people obey or you know, do their jobs or anything because people were already doing this on their own in the belief that they will be rewarded for all these things in their next life or in their afterlife. That was that is something very curious. All right. Now, philosophical systems. So philosophy, you know what a philosophy is. It's all about, you know, very uh, 
basically things that we don't understand okay uh, how the universe originated about soul god you know such things so uh, uh, in those times in ancient times relation between soul and god etc were tried to be explained by lots and lots of philosophers in india we do not see much discussion on god and soul in any other part of the world clear this is very much an indian thing i mean uh, there are discussions on god and soul and all in uh, every say culture but we do not find them in as much amount as we've seen in india all right indians also developed a materialistic view of the world clear philosophy doesn't mean that it's all about god and soul but there was another philosophy in india which is all about materialism and the world view best example is the sankhya system sankhya system which is developed by kapila it is actually a philosophical one of the oldest philosophical systems in india probably the oldest all right sankhya system says that the soul can attain liberation only through real knowledge which can be acquired through perception inference and hearing everything materialistic everything that is worldly if your sense organs cannot achieve it or if your sense organs cannot perceive it then that is not real knowledge okay so can you perceive god through your sense organs no right i mean we can't see god we can't hear god we can't feel god i mean in the in a in a materialistic sense okay i am not saying that uh, in a in a philosophy i am not saying it in a say religious or say philosophical term but in a purely materialistic way we cannot perceive god in through any of our sense organs as such because of this fact sankhya system does not recognize existence of god understood since sankhya system believes that uh, only real knowledge can liberate our soul and real knowledge is that knowledge which we can perceive through our sense organs and since god is not something that we can perceive through our sense organs god the existence of god is not recognized you got the logic right that is sankhya system and the development of reasoning in this period also helped a lot in formulating such philosophies okay nyaya sutra nyaya sutra is basically a book on reasoning okay so nyaya sutra mentions four proofs or pramanas comprising perception inference comparison and testimony so these four perception inference comparison and testimony these four are four logical ways to arrive at a real knowledge okay a correct conclusion so these were devised by i know nyaya sutra nyaya sutra mentions these four pramanas we find detailed discussions regarding you know what is valid and invalid etc okay what is a valid theory what is a invalid knowledge and all these are very well you know explained in detail in nyaya sutra materialistic philosophies are also uh, you know of some other types for example charvaka's philosophy of lokayata it is a very highly materialistic philosophy he argued that what is not experienced by man through his sense organs does not really exist that's it okay what cannot be experienced through the sense organs does not exist which implies god does not exist as simple as that again this is a materialistic philosophy there is the counter counterpart of this as well there are many philosophies which actually believes in god and you know which emphasizes emphasizes on bhakti and all along with knowledge okay that is a different section but lokaya the philosophy of charvaka also does not uh, believe in god says that god do not exist now with the decline of trade handicrafts and urbanism the idealist system of philosophy came to the fore clear earlier it was all materialistic so i mean uh, trade was flourishing economy was good people was able to buy all the kind of goods that they want clear so everything was very much materialistic in nature but a point in history came when trade collapsed economy collapsed commerce collapsed we already learned about such a such a phase clear and when such a phase came materialistic phase started to lose its glory clear and people began to believe that world is an illusion clear anything that um, everything can vanish just like that so materialistic world is an illusion people began to believe all these things and these sorts of belief 
spread through all parts of the world, even in Europe. Okay, even in Europe, we see such philosophers. For example, the very famous German philosopher Schopenhauer. He, you know, we can find out uh, in his th uh, theories, uh, historians have found that um, Indian Vedas and Upanishads are actually used in Schopenhauer's philosophies as well. Clear? Even in Schopenhauer's philosophy, Indian, uh, say, philosophical systems such as Vedas and Upanishads, etc., are used a lot. That world is a, an illusion, world is Maya and it is not real. Clear? So, th this is how you can relate economy and philosophies. It is actually because of the economical collapse that led to the understanding that materialistic, you know, glory is not everlasting. And this led to more, you know, pronounced faith that there is something beyond materialism. Clear? Something much more idealistic. Understood? So, these are also the basis of some of our philosophical systems. Now, let's go to crafts. Okay, I mean, now onwards, it's very much easy. I mean, most of the things we have already covered. So, I will be going faster. All right. So, the first great contribution was made in the time of Harappan culture. You know what are the crafts and uh, artifacts we found from Harappa. The Bronze Age culture was very much flourishing. Large number of fire, you know, fired bricks, town planning, craft, commerce, agriculture, etc., etc. We find very beautiful paintings and, you know, etc. in Ajanta. Very high quality paintings that it even survives today. After 3000 years, it's still, it's still there. Okay, then expertise in uh, art of steel making. Indian steel, which is also known as woods in later times, is world famous, demanded in every part of the world. And no other country could match the skill of Indian craftsmen in steel making. Okay, quality. As far as quality is concerned, Arthashastra, uh, sorry, Kautilya's Arthashastra is the best textbook from ancient India. We also find a very great ruler in Ashoka regarding, you know, you already know about Kalinga war and his policy of non aggression which he took upon later, thanks to Buddhism. But in general, we can say that ancient Indian kings were more or less religiously tolerant. Correct? At least most of them stressed that the wishes of the followers of other religions should also be respected. True, right? Think about any ancient Indian king, except one or two. Most of them, in general, we can say that at least most of them followed a very tolerant religious policy. No persecution as such. Exceptions are there, obviously, but in general, not many persecutions. And, you know, besides Greece, India was the only other country to experiment with some form of democracy. Also correct, ancient assemblies and all. Okay, but it is not pure democracy. It is not, I mean, not at all comparable to modern day democracy. But still, at least in a very minor basis, we can see some sort of democracy in ancient India. The only other ancient, uh, you know, area, region, which we can see, where we can see democracy is ancient Greece. All right, now comes science and mathematics. Very important for us. And this is a longer topic uh, compared to everything that we have seen so far. We have not discussed about this part so far, okay, science and mathematics. So, we are going to see many new points here. So, before that, any questions? Okay, means philosophy in ancient Indian history and had more writings compared to European? Uh, not necessarily, okay. I mean, it's not like that. It's just that it is actually the Indian philosophers who focused more on Atma and God and all. Clear? Atma and Jivatma, Paramatma, these kinds of things were more focused by Indian philosophers. In other parts of the world, you know, philosophies were associated with a lot of other things. Say, for example, how the universe is created. Okay, and such kinds of philosophies have been discussed in a lot. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all these people. Okay, we have, I mean, I think in, in our history classes from school days, we have learned about at least some of them. But in Indian, as far as Indian philosophies are concerned, we look a lot more in depth into soul uh, and, you know, God, etc, etc. Rather than how universe is created or anything. Clear? It's not that we are the only ones who have worked on this. Obviously, the, almost all the cultures in the world has looked into these sorts of philosophies. But Indians has done it more around this period. Okay. So, science and mathematics. Uh, so, in ancient times, religion and science were very much linked together. 
okay in modern day religion and science are basically head to head okay i mean i think you have watched that film angels and demons okay at least or read that book angels and demons uh then you know what i am talking about religion and science usually does not go hand in hand clear but in ancient times these were inextricably linked why because astronomy made very great strides in india because the planets began to be regarded as gods okay earlier when human beings were unable to exp you know explain regarding planetary movements and all all of them were concerned as gods okay all of them were basically branded as gods so once this branding happened these planets began to be observed by human beings the movements of the planets etc etc and these observations basically led human beings into the field of science named as astronomy so religion played a huge role in development of science in earlier periods understood similarly once this was started to be studied in depth changes in seasons were understood weather conditions started to become very much clear all these were important for agricultural activities correct right again very much useful grammar and linguistics arose around this period why what was what was the religious contribution in the field of grammar and linguistics because according to brahmanas they stressed that every vedic prayer and mantra should be recited in a very meticulous precise method okay there is a meter okay i mean every mantra that we say is actually set according to some laws and you know some precision some metric precisions clear and this actually led to the growth of grammar linguistics so and so and the first result of scientific outlook of indians was the development of sanskrit grammar panini and ashtadhyayi okay panini is very famous sanskrit grammar ashtadhyayi so this is one of the first or the earliest scientific outlook of indians mathematics astronomy medicine all these branches developed around this time as far as mathematics is concerned indians are credited to have contributed in three main phases one notation system two decimal system and three the use of zero clear indian notation system like you know numbers and all this was you know actually copied by arabs and from arabs it was taken by the europeans and when britishers again came back to india the same notation system which indians developed came to be called as arabian arabic numerals clear it is indians only in from indians arabs arabs took it britishers or the europeans came to know about this through arabs and when europeans came to india they since they got it from arabs they began to call the system as arabic clear but it is actually an indian system similarly both greeks and indians contributed in algebra clear yeah? but in western europe its knowledge was acquired not from greece but from the arabs who acquired it from india so again india is the land from where it all began clear yeah? the brick constructions in harappa actually shows that people had a very good understanding about measurement and geometry okay harappa had a very beautiful town planning system all the you know, roads and streets you know crossed in 90 degrees this cannot be done by some people you know some ran in a random way okay if this has to be such scientifically organized then there should be a system of you know mesh proper measurement and geography and uh, geometry and all right so harappan uh, system basically informs us that people knew about all these things in vedic period we study about sulva sulva sutra which was used to construct the fire pits okay the sacrificial pits so this is one of the earliest textbooks on measurements and geometry abastamba again produced a practical geometry for construction of altars in which the kings could offer sacrifices this book okay abastamba basically describes about acute angle obtuse angle right angle etc etc all these are indian actually indians are the pioneers in mathematics Aryabhata formulated a very famous method to calculate the area of triangle and this is the origin of trigonometry clear then there is this very famous book called surya siddhanta surya siddhanta is said to have been written by somebody named as lata deva or something like that but nobody it's not accurate okay we are not exactly sure who the author is but we think it is something like lata deva who was a disciple of aryabhata some textbook says that aryabhata only wrote, wrote surya siddhanta but again it's very much inconclusive just like aryabhata 
uh, Varaha Mehra also was a very prominent mathematician uh, in those times, a very prominent personality. Okay, Aryabhata calculated the position of planets in accordance with the Babylon system, Babylonian method. He discovered the causes of lunar and solar eclipse, circumference of Earth, which was calculated by Aryabhata, is considered correct even today. Think about it. 2000 years ago, a person was able to accurately measure the circumference of Earth, or at least his number is very close to the actual measurement. So Indians were that much advanced in mathematics around this period. He pointed out that Sun is stationary and Earth is the one that is rotating. Clear? If you remember what happened to Copernicus, okay, when Copernicus came up with the same theory, uh, we know what happened. He was, uh, the religious orthodoxy in Europe basically destroyed him, right? It, it, the heliocentric theory of, uh, you know, which emerged in that time was completely negated with the geocentric theory. You know this. So, uh, Aryabhata actually predicted this or say in, informed us about this 2000 years ago. And all Aryabhata's works is actually entitled in a very book, neat book known as Aryabhatiya. Use of zero. Use of zero and decimal system also find a place in Aryabhatiya. But it is not that much used in India. That is the main thing. Okay, there were pioneers in India who were able to do all these things. But the Indians simply did not care about it. That's it. It is not commonly used in India. Actually, it, were used, it was used much more by the Italian traders in Arabian regions for bookkeeping system. Clear? For bookkeeping purposes, for trade and commerce, it is the Italian traders who were in the Arabian regions who used the information in Aryabhatiya, the decimal system, the zero system, etc, etc. Although we are the ones who formulated all these things. Algebra developed under Brahmagupta during the first half of 7th century. Varahi Mehra's very famous book known as Brihat Samhita was written around 6th century. In this book, he states that moon rotates around the earth and earth rotates around the sun. For this, you know, he has utilized a lot of Greek works as well. So there was give and take between the Greeks and Indians. Clear, both of these civil, uh, people were highly advanced at this point of time. So there are many Greek thinkers and Indian thinkers also. There were many give and takes between the Greeks and Indians. But Ahimira's plant and animal classifications enriched the agricultural knowledge. Also led to many observations on the seasons and weather. But Ahimira was also an astronomer come astrologer. Clear? Yeah. So, uh, astrology also got a lot of focus in this time. In, ru uh, in the rural areas, the priest Jyotishi became an integral part of Jashmani system. J Jashmani system means a system where people work for the landlord or say people work for the uh, master or somebody and in return they will get grains or some cereals or something like that. That is the Jashmani system. Clear? Yeah. And in this system, the priest Jyotishi became very much important. So the Jyotisha, Jyotisha Shastra, that is astrology, also dominated around this point in Indian society. All right, Indian craftsmen contributed to the development of chemistry. Indian dyers invented very lasting colors. Actually, the color of blue was discovered by India. Okay, it is Indian dyers who actually came up with the color blue. Clear? Yeah? And we already have spoken about the Indian steel and all, which is very much world famous. So all these are the contributions of Indians in the field of mathematics and science. Now let's see medicine. Before that, any questions? If we would uh, have not connected religion with science, maybe the result would have different in science and technology. Yes, obviously. Okay, I mean, uh, some obviously there will be some differences uh, relating in which all these things have progressed. Maybe we would not have cared that much about planets and astronomy would be very much still young okay and uh, say a lot of things would have been explained in a different way clear and you know ra rationalism and faith would have gone in a very much different path right so obviously difference would, would have been there but we cannot be exactly sure because we are you know, you know it never happened so all we can do right now is speculate okay now medicine we have almost come to the end of this chapter. Okay, only a few more slides. Uh, now medicine, okay. So in ancient times itself, anatomy was studied very well. And people knew about 
methods to diagnose diseases and you know prescribe medicines etc etc earliest mention of medicines can be found in atharva veda prelims okay prelims question earliest mention of uh, medicines can be found in atharva veda but the thing is the remedies said in atharva veda is completely filled with magical charms and spells and you know all these things medicine was not developed in scientific lines in ancient period at least during the you know atharva veda period and all. okay i mean they have identified the disease and you know there are mentions of medicines but remedies were mentioned as magical charms and spells and you know, superstitious things in second century ad we come across two very famous people one a surgeon named as shushruta second a uh, physician named as charaka okay these two people were uh, actual uh, people engaged with medicine in a scientific manner Sushruta wrote the very famous Sushruta Samhita, which actually describes how to operate cataract, stone disease, and several other ailments. He also mentions as many as 121 implements that can be used for surgery. He also stresses the need to have a very, you know, uh, safe diet as well as cleanliness, etc., etc. Okay, such surgeons existed in second century AD. Think about it. A lot of the things that they found out is unknown to us right now. Okay, I mean, I mean, modern day medicine has evolved a lot, but even then, a lot of things that uh, that was popular at uh, all, a lot of things that the ancient Indian people knew is lost for us because of various reasons. Okay, then uh, Charaka Samhita, Charaka Samhita written by Charaka again. It is a, like an encyclopedia on Indian medicine. It speaks about the types of fever, leprosy, hysteria, tuberculosis etc etc names of large number of plants and herbs are also written here so that is very useful for finding the medicinal qualities of various plants clear so medicine was also developing in a substantial scale geography uh, as far as the indians are concerned we know a lot of lot about the geography of india indian subcontinent but as far as the geography of other lands are concerned indians were not that much uh, say knowledgeable okay we did not we only knew a very little about the geography of lands outside india as within india you know rivers mountains you know places of pilgrimage etc etc are all described in epics and puranas okay in uh, kalidasa's works and all uh, we find a lot about indian geography in ramayana for example we, uh, there is talk about various kinds of mountains various kinds of rivers so Puranas and epics and such books actually tells us a lot about Indian geography. Although Indians were acquainted with China and Western countries, they neither had a clear idea of their location nor their distances from India. We knew that such countries existed, but we had no idea about the correct location of China or correct location, correct distance to China or whatever. Some knowledge of navigation was contributed by the craft of contributed to the craft of ship building all right ancient indian princes did not pay any particular attention to navigation that is also very important so far whatever kingdoms we have studied none of them maintained a strong navy i mean uh, there was navy for certain kingdoms yes chola had a very strong navy i am not denying that ashoka and ashoka actually sent emissaries to silanga and all we learned that also but even then we do not see a substantially you know large navy that we can speak about probable reason is that most of the emperors in india were ruling from a landlocked area okay kanauj Padale, uh, say padaleputra padaleputra is filled with rivers but again not close to sea or anything uh, most of the ancient centers of power were landlocked towards northern part of india central heart of india it is actually the peninsula kingdoms which contributed a lot into shipmaking and navigation and all since the major emperors were all north indians they did not pay much attention to oversea navies and all why because their threat was from northwestern part of india so to effectively resist against that they needed a strong army not a navy so they paid very less attention and it changed only when europeans came to india clear then finally art and culture I think this is the last topic. No, okay. Strength and weakness also. Three slides remaining. Art and culture. Ancient Indian masons and craftspeople produced wonderful works of art 
starting from Harrapin Tank. I'm just reading through this, okay? All these things are something that you know. So I'm just going to read through this. Monolithic pillars were erected by, you know, Ashoka, very, you know, glossy and polished and all, which match the glows of Northern black polished wear. Maurya polished pillars are, you know, mounted with capitals such as, you know, lions and all. We talked about the Maurian capitals. We will study more about it in the art and culture session, which starts tomorrow. The lion capital, which is actually of Maurian origin, is our national emblem, or the emblem of Republic of India. Correct? Then we have many cave temples all over India, Ajanta being one example. Painting also, Ajanta paintings are very, very, very important. The lines and colors used in Ajanta are unmatched in the world until the Renaissance period in Europe. Okay, Renaissance period is in medieval India. Okay, sorry, medieval history of the world. So until that point of time, we do not come across anything that is even merely close to the Ajanta painting. So that was the skill of Indian craftsmen in those times. Indian uh, art and crafts spread, uh, spread to different parts of the world, Central Asia, China, South Asia, Southeast Asia, etc, etc. Focal point of the spread of Indian art in Afghanistan region, etc. was Ganthara. We will study more about Ganthara art in the upcoming classes. Okay. The first statue of Buddha was fashioned in Ganthara style. Ganthara style is basically a Greco-Roman style. It has a lot of Hellenistic features. So Greco style mixed with local indigenous style. That is Ganthara art. So the first statue of Buddha was basically fashioned in Ganthara style. Okay. The temples constructed in South India served in some ways as models for construction of temples in Southeast Asia. We talked about Borobudur temple yesterday. We talked about Angor Vat yesterday. So these temples were more or less shaped based on the architecture of South Indian temples. Clear? Because of the influence of Brahmanism. Writing was first undertaken in mid 3rd millennium BC in Harappan culture, though this script was not so far deciphered. Huge monastic establishments of Nalanda attracted a lot of students from different parts of the world, especially China and Tibet. And the standards of examination in Nalanda was so tough. Okay, there was a you know, there was a person called Dwara Pandita. If you want to get admission to Nalanda University, you have to pass the examination put forth by the Dwara Pandita, the gatekeeper. Alright, so that was the kind, level of universities India had in those times. It was a residential come teaching institution, and uh, around 200 villages were especially used for uh, revenue for this university. As far as literature is concerned, Rigveda is the earliest specimen of Indo-Aryan language, already told you. Kalidasa's Abhijnana Shagundalam and many other works are translated into almost all languages in the world. Okay, Almost all the prominent languages in the world has a copy of Kalidasa's Abhijnana Shagundalam. So, such marvelous literatures were created in ancient India. Okay, So, now let's sum up regarding strength and weaknesses. What are the strengths of ancient India and what are the weaknesses? Strengths I already mentioned. Everything that I have so far mentioned are its strengths. Okay, maths, uh, science, medicine, art, literature, everything. All these are part of strength of ancient India. Now let's, uh, we have to see some weaknesses also. We already learned about the weaknesses, but let's summarize them. It's difficult to sum up the entire thing together. But even then, one thing is, most of the Harappan objects that we have found are in India and Pakistan museums. Okay, in different museums in India and Pakistan, we can still see all these things. But the contemporary Mesopotamian antiquities have all been lost or destroyed in the second Gulf War. Clear? So that rich sources which would have been there from Mesopotamia are all gone. It's no more existing. Very recently, a lot of Buddhist artifacts in the Afghanistan region are also gone because of the certain conservative uh, Islamic factions. That also I mentioned yesterday. But as far as Harappan culture and artifacts are concerned, a lot of that is preserved in Indian museums and Pakistan. Okay. In post Harappan times, people contributed to the field of science and civilization. All these are positive things. But the negative starts now. Caste system based on Brahmanical ideology. That persists even today. Even after all these advancements in uh, society, still the caste system persists. Okay, that is basically an insult to all of us, uh, but unfortunately, it's a fact. This kinds of social discrimination exist even today in India. 
caste system it's fine i mean but the caste based discrimination that is not fine all right and that still exists so, i mean that was that is something that gandhiji's that was gandhiji's ideology i mean gandhiji was never against caste system he was against caste based discrimination clear but ambedkar was against caste system as such that is the difference between gandhi and ambedkar just mentioned it to your for your knowledge that's all all right so unfortunately caste based discrimination exists even today women status of women women were considered as items of property back in ancient india and even in modern india things are very still pretty bad for women that's also a fact a lot of things have improved but unfortunately still we hear about dowry deaths we still hear about female infanticide uh, you know child marriage so and so common people continue to suffer loss of land yes unequal distribution of land and impoverishment of cultivators yeah everything is amassed by the wealthy sections common man are landless he you know lives a very poor life still that economic disparity is very much there right when whenever we talk about in uh, say uh, rich countries okay in general we say that about 90% of the wealth of the country is in the hands of 10% of the population right i mean we say such uh, such a statement right which means there is clear economic inequality in the country starking economic inequality sharp inequalities in all important fields not just economy in society also we can see that inequalities clear for that only we have many you know reservation systems and all these things which which itself creates another problem okay so that is again debatable but uh, in one problem at a time anyway we have all these kinds of uh, you know inequalities on almost all important fields although some ancient textbooks looked upon the world as a family this ideal would not make any impact also correct indians had this very important concept of vasudeva kudumbakam okay when dr apj abdul kalam uh, gave a speech in united nations he actually brought this up vasudeva kudumbakam the entire world as one family that was that is an indian concept very famous glorious indian concept but think about it it's just a term nothing more in no part in history that we can actually see the world working as a family in every opportunity anyone gets that person will try to take advantage of it that's it within india itself there were plenty of kingdoms all in fighting quarreling within each other when uh, the foreign powers came to india they also tried to take advantage of the situation same i mean uh, then we come across a world when colonization was the main aspect all the european countries tried to take advantage of the rest of the world so vasudeva kudumbakam although it is a very ideal concept very grand concept never came into being so it has zero impact actually in reality so these are the drawbacks so these are the weaknesses clear so this sums up our ancient indian sessions so today we have seen a sum up or a summary of everything that we have learned so far in ancient india and by this lecture we have completed the ancient india textbook by r s sharma sir all right so tomorrow onwards i will start the final lecture series that is on uh, art and culture and there are there, there will be about six lectures i think I'm not sure and that is based on the 11th standard art and culture textbook i, I mean i will go with a new textbook okay more or less both are the same so i'll go with the new textbook and uh, say we will look into the art and culture portions in depth in these textbooks using this textbook final questions even though trade decline a uh, uh, affected economy in ancient india but still had that much economy or wealth which attracted medieval individuals into indian yes that is correct that is true trade and no say trade and economy etc etc uh, collapsed in these times but think about it one of the reasons why this collapsed was that certain other countries were trying to preserve itself especially rome a lot of gold and silver from rome was actually sinking into india same goes for many other countries okay from all these nations everything was coming into india clear and then the trade and economy etc collapsed so even now india has a very you know very very solid uh, foundation as far as say resources are concerned and as far as india's natural resources are concerned it is we can say that basically it is untapped okay obviously some resources are used but even then we can say that it is still very much pristine and intact 
and all this basically attracts medieval indian uh, medieval rulers from different parts of the world into india in ancient india i already told you temples began to become very much important temple towns sprang up temples began to become important brahmanas were given land grants and revenues were collected everything went into temple brahmadeya devadana all these systems and all these made temples very very wealthy superstition also okay lots of people began to offer lots and lots of uh, resources and money into temples this basically made temples more and more prosperous more and more wealthy this is one of the best best reasons why uh, you know mohammed of ghazni invaded somnath temple okay uh, because the temple was that much wealthy same goes for mo most of the ancient indian temples and india's natural wealth was still untapped it is the british who basically drains everything away until then even in medieval india we see that india is still the land of riches because we have that kind of natural resources that is true spices no you can't you can't simply grow spices in some part of the world okay it has to have certain climatic factors and it, india is that country where you can see it some latin american countries are there some african countries are there if you think about it the and some southeast asian countries are also there if you think about it these are the countries which all the colonizers in medieval india uh, in medieval uh, era focused on all the european colonizers everybody try to tap upon the natural resources of all these countries these were the things that attracted them uh, into all these places think about it okay europe did not try to colonize germany uh, sir, sorry britain did not try to colonize germany or germany did not try to colonize france everybody tried to colonize countries which are so called as the third world okay latin american countries say european uh, sorry african countries asian countries why because of the natural capital all right so uh, india continue india and southeast asia as such continue to have a lot of riches in all terms in money also in natural resources until modern india when everything is drained okay so that's it thank you all for joining and everything uh, my slides will be uplo uploaded in the telegram channel the link is given here it's also given in the youtube description section please like this video before you go also kindly share it with your friends and uh, yeah that's it ancient india is also over so i hope you have benefited from my classes please leave a comment in the public comment section after i finish i end this stream okay so that uh, your feedbacks or your reviews on my classes could say uh, be useful for other students okay so that's it thank you again see you tomorrow with art and culture sessions until then bye bye